Hi, I'm Tyson Franklin and welcome to this week's episode of It's No Secret with Dr. T. Deciding to do something a little bit different again this week. I've got another podcast that you may or may not be aware of called Podiatry Legends Podcast. And I get a lot of podiatrists that come on there, share their stories and what they're doing in the career. Now, a lot of podiatrists, of course, listen to that particular podcast. But one of my guests, Simon Bartold, the conversation I had with him was so interesting. I thought I need to get it over on to It's No Secret with Dr. T. Whether you're a podiatrist or not, I think you will really enjoy the conversation I have with Simon because he's he's been to four Olympic Games, he's lectured in 42 different countries, he worked with ASIC Footwear for over 20 years, and he was actually headhunted by Salomon to head up their design and development and lived in France for four years doing it. He has an amazing story and he's had an amazing career in podiatry. And I don't think it matters what you've done yourself or what you're currently doing. I think when you listen to Simon's story, you'll go, wow, what can I do myself? Now, if you've listened to this episode before on Podiatry Legends podcast, listen to it again because you will pick up more the second time you listen to it. So I started off the conversation asking Simon how he got into podiatry. And this is where we're going to start. Okay. And I'll come back when this conversation is finished. So my, my great passion as, as a young fellow was I was very, very passionate about animals. And so I went, took myself off to uni and did a degree in zoology and physiology. My major was in zoology. So I thought I was going to get a job with uh, with National Parks and Wildlife or the CSIRO. Yeah. Um, and back then, getting a job with the CSIRO was, you know, you basically had to wait for somebody to die before you could get in there. So, so I'd done this degree and I was pretty much the most unemployable bloke in the world. So there was just nothing available at all. <laughs> And so my, my dear old dad, who was a pharmacist, who also was a chiropodist and used to dabble in the back of his, uh, his, of his pharmacy shop, said, I reckon you should have a look at podiatry because I know a bloke whose name's John Pickering, who was like the, the grandfather of podiatry in Australia. I remember him. And uh, I'm going to send you off to see John Pickering and you can see what you think. And I, you know, my, my reaction was typical. You know, are you out of your mind? Why would I want to be dealing with feet all day long? Went and saw John Pickering. And enrolled in podiatry, and that's where it started. And John, and this is down in South Australia, wasn't it? Because that's where John Pickering it's down was. Adelaide, yeah. Yeah. So that you, you, but you did it at uh, Adelaide University, was it? Yeah, UniSA. Yeah. Okay, so you went through. Was biomechanics an important part of the course back then, or was it more general podiatry? No, there was there was there was absolutely zero biomechanics, so it wasn't included in the course at all. And biomechanics really started in Australia. So as you can tell that I'm quite old, biomechanics started in Australia as a series of private lecture tours with um, Justin Langer and Rick Jay and um, guys like Richard Blake. Okay, who came yeah. out and, and taught biomechanics at private seminars. So you had to go and pay for it, basically. And I can, I can well remember sitting down listening to Justin Langer talking about uh, you know, angles of dangle, 16 degrees, 42 degrees, etc. And just thinking, not sure I'm ever going to get my head around this stuff. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the way it was taught back then. Okay, so so you you did your podiatry degree, you finished it, obviously, and then you started dabbling in the biomechanics outside of yeah, just general so, practice. So so I mean, I I I always been very active, and I had a, a lifetime passion for sport. And and I actually, my first job straight out of uni, I went straight into private practice. And I started working with a guy called Bill Kutcher, who was a, who was a great mentor and friend to me. And uh, he was probably one of the very few guys in Australia who was consistently doing work in the field of biomechanics. He was very active in that area and very committed to it and also was working in sports medicine. And he was actually an old footballer himself. He was a, he was a, he was a, a league footballer in South Australia. So he's pretty well connected. And I worked with Bill for probably 18 months or so, and then I had an opportunity to join a multidisciplinary sports medicine clinic, which which I think I was probably the first podiatrist in Australia to, to join a clinic like that because it was so long ago. Yeah, It was called Adelaide Sports Sciences Clinic. It doesn't exist anymore. But that was amazing because, you know, I was thrown into contact with all these guys who were sports docs and, um, you know, large sports physio practice. We had a masseur. We had... Uh, couple of personal trainers we had an, uh, an adjacent orthopedic clinic and this is this is I mean we're talking about 1984 so sports medicine was really absolutely in its infancy back then um, <clears throat> and I got exposed to all of these these terrific things and the guys I worked with particularly the sports docs and the physios 
you know, we, we had a terrific rapport. We we referred a lot to each other. We we sat down and talked about cases together. And Matt, you, you know, you learn on the job pretty yeah. quickly when you're in that sort of environment. It was it was it was a terrific thing for a, for a young graduate. So so obviously you got interest, you know, by going along to the well. Okay, there would have been a lot of people that went through podiatry with you at the same time. What was it about biomechanics that sparked your interest? Because you've made a career out of biomechanics and being a footwear expert there had to be something that really got to you that that others didn't see yeah i think you know i think i think it was a bit more than just biomechanics i think it was i think my passion has always been sports medicine yeah so more than more than just pure and you know obviously they're they're interrelated in the did world you have a background IT, what was your sport was it was there a sport that you uh, excelled at that got you into uh, well, sport in the first well, place. My, well, my believe it or not, my my competitive sport was was water skiing. So I I competed in water skiing for many years. So that's that's the the triple event, which is a slalom, tricks, and jump. Yeah. So that that's that's what tournament skiing is all about. So I did that for a long, long time. But I, I mean, I played a lot of sports. So I played footy, played tennis, did, did a lot of different things. But if I if I had one passion, it probably would be Australian football, and that that led me down a path because. Um, I took myself off to the local um, SNFL club, which so the SNFL is the level below the AFL. It's one of the feeder leagues yeah. to the AFL. Took myself off to this club, the, the mighty Red Legs, Nord Football Club. Approached a guy called Brian Sando, who at that time was the Olympic team doctor, and said, here I am. This is what I can do. Um, I want to work for the club. And he said, yes. And I might add that I worked for that club for... 15 or 16 years and it was never paid a cent but <laughs> and this is an important message for anybody who cares to listen to this that um you know i often ask kids what they want to do and they say we want to do this want to do that and i said well you realize you might have to do that voluntarily don't you and then sort of the shutters come down um but if you really want to get immersed and you really want to learn you have to be prepared to put your hand up and do it for nothing that's just the way it works I think that applies to most things. Yeah, it does. You know, from that from that opportunities arose. So, you know, I started working with Adelaide 36ers in the NBL, and at one point in time, I was the only sports medicine um, person with the team. So I travelled with the team all over Australia. I treated things like broken jaws. I mean, this is a podiatrist talk about learning on the job. So yeah. I learned sports medicine. You know, I learned a lot of stuff. I had to. I had to know about things like drugs in sport. I had to know what the players were taking, yada, yada, yada. And these are very early days. So, you know, these these opportunities that were given to me were just absolutely priceless. You know, you couldn't you couldn't you couldn't pay enough money to have those opportunities. So once you start once the wheels start rolling, you do actually find that that opportunities will open up and um, you know, you, you then you then sort of start to get on the on the locomotive and away it goes. Okay, first time I heard you speak was, oh, it was early 90s and it was, I think it was on the Sunshine Coast. It might have been a national conference or a state conference on the Sunshine Coast. And in Twin, Twin Towers. In, Twin uh, Towers, that's in the, the one. The and I always yeah. remember you made this comment from stage and I almost wet my pants. And you were talking about how, you were talking about orthotics and how a lot of podiatrists say, they, they cure so many things. And I bet he goes, yep, but however, I'm yet to see anyone claim even though it's not proven yet that it can't cure hemorrhoids and <laughs> i <laughs> you know what's funny the only thing i remember from that conference was that comment <laughs> and uh, but you were, and you were with a you were with asics then i think you were doing a lot of work uh with, yeah. the, with footwear yeah, yeah. how did you get into the footwear side of things i always thought that was really interesting because you came you became the footwear guru well ba basically i got involved in that because I, I essentially shot my mouth off all the time so i was down adelaide so i was working with the footy club right and i was seeing all these players who were getting injured and, and it's not very often you can make a direct correlation between footwear and injury but in football you can yeah footy boots injured players it's that simple um, because they're so primitive so the, the local asex rep down adelaide was a fellow called he basically got got sick of me bagging the footy boots and he, and he came around to my practice one day and he said well you know if you reckon you can do better then put your money where your mouth is come and we'll 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 do some work together and that's how it started so it was it was aussie football that started me with asics and you know initially dabbling a bit with different projects and then 
um, eventually in 2007, going completely full-time on a global basis with ASICS. But I worked with ASICS in one form or other for over 20 years. Yeah. And, it, you know, what, what, a, what an incredible experience that was. You know, I've, I've travelled all over the world with them. I, I, uh, I met all sorts of different people, had the opportunity. It's, it's a cool thing when you see somebody running down the road and you see the shoe they're wearing and you can actually remember yep that was my idea or i had this input to that shoe you know that's 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 a really that's a really fulfilling experience to have i think it'd be a great experience but i like what you said the if you go back a few steps it was all the work you did for free that you gave up your time that opened up these doors and i think that's what a lot of uh, a lot of younger graduates miss is they keep thinking i must do something and i must be paid a certain amount of money for that effort i put in not realizing and and you'll see the the sign behind me on the wall. The next connection you make could be the one that changes your life. Yeah. And and I honestly believe that that it's the more things you do like for free, the more doors that open up. You don't know what's through those doors. You don't know what opportun- yeah. opportunities are actually going to arise. So your career really kicked off by doing something for nothing, and it built. Oh yeah, I, I mean I, I I absolutely believe that. And I mean I think the way you got to look at it, and the way I always looked at it, is that I was being paid. I mean. If I'd had if I'd had to pay for what I was being taught, it yeah. would have cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, you know, I was being taught on the job, so I was more than happy to not be paid for it. Um, you know, and what I was observing and the experiences I was getting. I mean, you know, you're sitting on the sidelines at a grand final um, with <laughs> fifty thousand people, and you're you're there in the box, you, yeah. on, like on the ground. You're in the you're in the players' box. This thing, not many people get experience, you know, and, and you're you're a young podiatrist who's sitting there and you think, well, that's pretty cool, um, you know. And and I can see that player. I helped him get to the grand final. You know, how much is that worth? Yeah, I must admit there was there was a particular basketball game here in Cairns, and I was doing all the podiatry stuff for the Taipans, and one of the um, one of the opposing teams that was up here playing, one of their players had hurt the foot. So all of a sudden, they knew I was in the they knew I was uh, in the box or whatever. The next thing, I've been waved down, and I've gone over to the other team to help one of their players actually get back on the court. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a trial game before the season was actually kicking off. Yeah. But I must admit, and then the rest of the game, I'm actually sitting there on the bench with the opposition team, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is pretty cool. It's a, it's yeah. and, and it's the same sort of thing. It's it's just, I think it's being there. Just yeah. exposing yourself to as many new things as possible and finding out what it is that you like. Yeah, it is. It's it's the experience. You know, you don't know where it, where it leads you. You know, I mean, I, I've I've now I've now been to four Olympic games. I mean, I had you cool. told me that in 1982, I would have said you're nuts. That that's not going to happen. Um, but you know, and, and I've I've at last count, I've I've lectured in 42 countries, and you know, th- this is where podiatry can take you if you. If you think about it, and if you, you know, when I talk to the kids about it, and I always say, "Who wants to be a sports podiatrist?" Everybody puts their hands up, and yeah. and I say, "Well, you know, that's that's great, but I wonder whether you're thinking about what other opportunities there might be, because you know, you might be entering a bit of a saturated field." But you know, I see opportunities everywhere in podiatry. Um, you know, I think the, the most the most underutilized or under, um, <clears throat> I suppose, underexposed field is probably rheumatology. You know, I, I think I think globally we've probably got one podiatry um, expert in rheumatology. His name's Professor Jim Woodburn, and he's uh, he's up in Glasgow, but he's the only one I'm aware of who's a true expert in the field. But these are people who, who whose main problem is their feet. Yeah. <laughs> so I just don't get it. I mean, why you know why are people not really upskilling themselves in this area and saying, okay, I'm going to put my hand up. But I'm going to say I know a bit more about rheumatology than the next bloke, so I reckon you should be coming to see me. But that's that's the interesting part, is you don't need to be an absolute expert to begin with. You just need to have a genuine interest in a particular area and know more. Just be a few steps ahead of everybody else, and as you're teaching them, you continue to learn yourself, yeah. and then your knowledge keeps that, growing. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I mean, you know, when I, when I thought about this, and people have often asked me, how come you don't do surgery and stuff like that, and I said... Look, I didn't do surgery because I, I felt like I had too much to learn in the area I was really interested in, and yeah. I did want—I did want to become an expert. Whether I achieved that or not, I have no idea. But, but, but I did want to—I had a passion for what I was doing, and I and I did want to know as much about it as I possibly could. 
and you know it's the odd story what makes an expert is it 10,000 hours whatever it is who, who knows but but basically you absorb as much as you possibly can and then at some point in time you will have a level that's superior to a lot of other people and so you'll be you'll be in you'll be with peers who uh, really know their stuff you know and yeah. that's 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 good yeah but it's also one of those things it's not just biomechanics and it's not sports and footwear it could be other like you said there's so many other areas of podiatry that people yeah. can really focus on it and just become better than everybody else and it's putting their time and effort in to do it yeah i mean it's really interesting i mean i, I i'm looking at looking at guys now who are becoming really involved in rehabilitation really involved in the coaching side of it and you know i think that's great i think that when you've got podiatrists who are developing those areas of expertise it's really important and it's also smart because we, the world of podiatry is changing. Yeah. I mean, you know, 20 years ago, you could base your practice around prescribing orthotics. Well, good luck with that one these days. I mean, that's that's getting harder and harder and harder. And if, if all you're doing is churning out orthotic devices, I, I'm here to predict that that gravy train is going to end pretty soon. I mean, it's just not going to be sustainable. So the smart practitioners are looking at this and thinking, okay, well, what other what other quivers do I what what other arrows do I have in the quiver? What else can I offer to my patients that yeah. is a value add that is going to really help them and that's going to enhance my practice? And and I think that's what the smart operators are doing. No, I think it's really good advice. And even the business side of things, you know, there's a lot of podiatrists that are, you know, are running really good businesses and then from that they've branched out and they're doing other things. How many how many podiatry podcasts were there around five mm-hmm. years ago? No. <laughs> None. I don't think no. there's too many now either. But it's one of the things I've been doing, involved in podcasting oh, a couple of years now that I've really sort of just loved it. And yeah. and people say, is there oh, is there money in podcasting? It depends how you how you look. It depends what you look at as money. Like I feel that like every time I talk to someone on a podcast, the value I get from the conversation, um, I can't put a price on that. Yeah. So it's it's worth. Yeah, a lot. I think, that, I think that that's exactly right. I mean. It, you know, I think I think what you're doing here is awesome because you're getting people to think about it. You know, I think you've got to think outside the box. I go to America often, and obviously I'm pretty embedded in the footwear industry. In America, um, you know, they closed they closed two two thousand retail footwear stores in in the USA last year. Wow! And that's that's because of e-commerce largely, um, but it's because of the changing retail environment. But I reckon I reckon someone's got to pick that slack up, and I reckon I know who that might be. Um, because in the world of podiatry and physio, you know, you, you got, I mean, I know in my practice, I was referring 30 to 40 pairs of shoes per week. Yeah. Well, you know, if retail is shutting down, then why would podiatry not be picking that, that slack up? And I know some podiatrists already are thinking this way, but uh, I'm going to, I'm going to predict on your, on your podcast right now, Tyson. Do it. I, I love predictions. In, in, yeah, in three or four years time, I reckon we, I reckon we will see, um, Podiatrists with professionally run um, shop in shop, if you like, so stores within podiatry practice where they are instead of referring out for footwear, they're referring in for footwear, which to me makes perfect sense. So yeah, well, that, that's a yeah. basic, basic business decision, isn't it? That, that makes complete sense. Well, we've been well in my clinic in Cairns. We've been doing it for the last um, twelve years. We had a yeah. we had a, we actually had a shoe shop in the podiatry clinic, but then the podiatry clinic got so busy. We moved our own shoe shop just up the road, and then when we bought a new building about eight years ago, we combined the two back together again. But I've seen yeah. more and more podiatrists starting to head in that area, and I think it's an area that they will definitely go in towards. Someone's got to, someone's got to service that industry. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the physio is definitely looking at it, but it's it's almost like a pharmacy model, isn't it? Where yeah, you know, you don't you don't go you don't go into a pharmacy these days and just buy a packet of aspirin. You can go in there and you can buy. I thought you were going to say something buy, else then. I don't know if you can buy a pair of undies or not, but pretty, you know, pretty yeah. much you can. There's lots of different things you can buy in a pharmacy. So they're they're a retail concern with a with a, a specialized a specialization in pharmacy. So, you know, I think I think podiatry will work. Will will go more down that model, um, and, and why shouldn't it? You know, it just just seems sensible to me. So one of the things interesting is just so people are aware that when I'm talking to Simon at the moment, he is in France or France, depending on how you like to say it. And how did you end up over there? That was an interesting story. We were talking about it before I press record. Yeah, well, I, I am in France. I'm, I'm looking out now. I'm in the most beautiful place. It's called Ancy. It's um, it's in the in the French Alps. 
I'm looking across beautiful Lake Antsy and I'm looking at a little hill called the Semnoz, which is covered in snow at the moment. Now, the Semnoz like, is a hill, um, but for those skiers out there now, the Semnoz is exactly the same height as the, it, the summit is the same height as Mount Hotham in Australia. So it's considered a hill. Behind me in this direction are the Western Alps. So we're talking about 4,000 metres and we've had a lot of snow in the last few days. I think it's about minus five outside right now. How did I get here? Um, yeah. Well, it's a great story. I got I got this very bizarre telephone call from a man with an outrageous French accent. And imagine Peter Sellers in uh, in the Pink Panther. All right. Yeah. Inspector Clouseau. It was a bit like that. So this guy says, uh, "Is this Simon Bertold?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> and he said, "Would you please come and give us a lecture on cushioning? We are from Salomon. Now Salomon are very famous for trail running shoes. Mm. They're, they're the world's biggest." producer of trail running shoes, and they're also an alpine sports company, so snow skis, etc. So I said, yep, I'm going to Manchester. You bring me, for the biomechanics summer school, you bring me across the, the channel and I'll come and give you a lecture on cushioning. So I duly gave my lecture on cushioning, and they said, right, we want you to come into this room. So I walked into a room, and there are three blokes there behind a table with three pairs of shoes on the table. And they said, hello, we'd, uh, we'd like your opinion on these shoes. And I said, well, may I be frank? And they said, yes. And I said, I think they're complete shit. And they, <laughs> and, they said, and, they said, and they said, so do we. Do you want a job? That is literally how it happened. So they offered me the job to head up their road running program. So to create their whole road running range um, from, a, from the, everything, from the last development to design protocols to the manufacturing to the development process. Um, and, and this is... This is something for a little podiatrist from Adelaide that was a bit too good to pass up because they said, unlimited budget, you can do whatever you want. Um, there's no baggage because we don't have a road running range, so yeah. go your hardest. So that's how I ended up here. I've been here for four years, and I'm heading home uh, in January of next year. So, so is your job nice. done? Have you designed the Barthold? Is that, is yeah, that, I have. Is that the shoot? Is it going to be I, called the Barthold? Here's, here's, my, here's my finest my finest style. This is called the Perique, and this is a very unusual shoe. You can see it's got a... So what, what's the shoe a, called? It's called the Predict. Predict. And uh, you can see the bottom unit kind of mirrors the main articulations of the foot, and those articulations are mirrored on the top as well, so the shoe is very, very flexible. Um, and it's sort of the antithesis of the running shoe, but we have been able to show extraordinary results like we've been able to show that we can reduce the uh, the load through the load the, the loads through the lit through the hip at about 20 percent yeah um it's as stable as as some of the most stable shoes on the market it weighs in at about 270 grams so it's very light and very flexible so it's kind of my goal was always to try to demonstrate to the world that you didn't have to have a motion control shoe for it to be stable and that the geometry of the shoe was far more important than other things. So I get too passionate about this stuff, so I'll stop talking about it. But oh, no, no, no. That's, but... that's, been my, that's been my baby. No, I think it's fantastic. So what you, what you're thinking on how they've got like minimalist shoes with maximum cushioning? You know, like, say the Hocker, for example, just out of curiosity, because I know that it's, it's like an up-and-coming shoe. I mean, I've got, I've got great respect for what they did. The, the, the two guys that started Hocker are actually ex Salomon blokes, and... Um, you know, they, they, they sort of started with the concept that they were observing oversized tennis rackets and oversized bike wheels in mountain biking. And they thought, well, why wouldn't we just build an oversized shoe? But they've done something quite interesting because they've, they've never made extravagant claims. So the reason the minimalist movement got itself into trouble is because they said, listen, we'll go back to the hemorrhoids, you know, wear our <laughs> shoe and it will cure your hemorrhoids. They, yeah. they, that's pretty much what they said, you know. And, um, and that was never going to fly. It just wasn't going to happen. The Hoka boys said, well, our shoes are big, they're not particularly attractive, they're highly cushioned, and they've got a rocker. There you go. Yeah, See what you think. <laughs> That's the only reason I was asking you, because I've got mine in front. I had mine sitting underneath the desk here, and yeah. uh, I, I just find them super comfortable. Yeah, as many people do, and you know, they, and they've sort of developed this, this incredible niche. I mean, they are one of the hot brands, and... I have a sneaking suspicion it's got nothing to do with the oversize or the or the cushioning. I've I've got a I've got a real suspicion that it's more to do with the rocker. Yeah. Um which which I think is a really important part of that shoe. Um, you know, we we prescribe that sort of footwear for, for people who are just chronically injured, typically in their fifth or sixth decade. 
Yeah. I'm, I'm ahead. And, and, of, I like to be ahead of the scale. I actually, well, damn it, I ain't well, in my fifth yeah. decade. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and, t- and typically, you know, it's completely anecdotal. We don't have any any evidence for it, but typically, um, a large proportion of these people get on really well with that shoe. And and I think yeah. it's probably got to do with the enhancement of the rollover process as a result of the of the rocker. So yeah, they've done it. They've done a terrific job. They've marketed themselves well and sensibly. They've got a really big market share in America now, and they they considered one of the hot brands in the world. Yeah, especially in the uh, triathlon world, it's uh, they've become really popular because we have the we have, in Kansas we have the Iron Man. Yep. So and because we sell Hocker in our shoe store, which you still have, yeah, we just become very you know, a reticular activating system notices the Hocker shoes, and when we're watching the races. Over the last uh, three or four years, we've just noticed the number of shoes appearing a little bit more uh, in each yeah. race. That's good. It's yeah, good well, they, you... well they, 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 they topped the shoe count in Kona this year. So yeah. the world champions, they were the number one shoe. And that, that I mean, that's that's an unbelievable achievement. I mean, ASICS has dominated that area for the last 20 years. Yeah. And I, don't, I think ASICS might have come in number three, actually. But uh, but Hoka were, were streets ahead. You know, they were they were way, way ahead. And, you know, this is how they made their name. So they, initially they made their name with uh, with the ultra, the ultra marathon guys. So the dudes who run things like, you know, the Western States or the Leaderville 100, the 100 mile races. Yeah. Um, and and it, it makes sense that when you're completely knackered after running, you know, 85 miles and you still got another 15 miles to go, that if you've got a rocker that's improving the rollover process and you've got cushioning um, that, that, that might be a that might be a good choice for you if you're running those distances. So that's now translated into Ironman, which of course is a pretty brutal event, and, and you've got to finish up by running a marathon after having been on a bike for 180 <laughs> k's. It's a pretty tough. Game. I, I know it's amazing. Hey, this is a great segue in to the athletic footwear masterclasses that you're running um, next year. I think. Are you a legend? <laughs> I think it is time to give that a plug. You need need to tell people what, what's coming up. What are you doing? Well, we are do- so yeah. So the masterclass is uh, there's two ways you can do this. You can come and visit me in France in in March, and it's a it's a two day event which is being held at Salomon HQ. So in the inner sanctum, and, and I can tell you right now, this might be the last time it's ever done because there's a lot of confidentially issues, confidentiality issues with major footwear companies these days, and they're just shutting it down. Yeah. So if you want to go to Brooks, Nike, Puma, Adidas, forget it. You can't. You can't go. So we're doing this at Salomon HQ in in March. It's a it's a two day event. It's full immersion. It's pretty amazing actually. But for Australia, we're also doing uh, the one day events, which is the reason I designed these Tyson is I wanted people kept on saying, well, how do I get into the industry? How do how do I do this? So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to teach you how to do that. So it, it is a real masterclass where the idea is that at the end of this fairly long day, I will. I will certificate you and say, I think you are now upskilled to a level where if you did want to go and approach a running shoe company and say, hey, I think I might be of assistance here, yeah. you will have the knowledge on all the processes involved in the athletic footwear world. So everything from design to development to history to the biomechanics to the prescription process, everything. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive um, That is fantastic. Day. Um, that they will then be able to, they'll be upskilled to that level. So, and if even if they don't want to do that, they're going to leave that masterclass knowing a whole lot more about footwear than the bike down the road. So yeah, it's running. It's running in um, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and Perth, Surrey, Brizzy. It's not going, not going up there at the moment. I have the date. If we go to bartoldclinical.com, and the dates are Melbourne is the second of March, Perth is the 9th, Sydney is the sixteenth, and Adelaide is the twenty third of March. And it's yep, that's three hundred and ninety eight dollars. Which I think's a bargain. Yeah, me too. All my stuff's too cheap. All my stuff's too cheap, Tyson. I don't know. I don't I reckon it's not good. I reckon that should be the early bird and uh, you should put it up. If if, if no, they haven't booked really by the end of, I mean, end of January, put it up. Yeah. It's pretty it's it's gone pretty well. I mean I think we're probably getting fairly close to capacity now anyway. So the the only one interestingly that is, is a bit slow is Adelaide, so maybe your maybe, hometown. maybe they don't like me that way. No, nah, but <laughs> but even Jesus had to leave town for people to listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, the hometown boy comes back and they're like, oh, it's just, yeah, it's just Simon. Yeah, yeah. We all know him. Yeah, I don't know. Might have something to do with the National Conference, I don't know, but I'm not too stressed <laughs> about it. But the other ones the other ones are getting pretty close. So if you do want to you do want to go, then then take a look at it. No, I think it's great. And the other but it's also the information they'll learn from that that they could take back into their clinic, teach their other team members. 
that will then transfer onto you know patients coming in you being more knowledgeable than the podiatrist down the road about footwear um has to set you apart from what other people what other podiatry uh, clinicians are doing oh absolutely yeah absolutely and i think that's so important because you know the in my world there's the it's embedded in myth and folklore you know every day i read this stuff like i just I, this morning actually while i was waiting to talk to you i read i read a blog a blog from a physio fortunately and he's quoted this paper which looked at the effect of cushioning in maximalist shoes and then he said then he went on to say and so so the paper concludes that minimalist shoes or barefoot are the way to go well they didn't even talk about minimalist shoes or barefoot it wasn't a part of the study <laughs> so i'm just looking at the what are you on mate i mean oh, of course i had to comment i couldn't help myself but you know, this is this is where podiatrists really can can gain um, an advantage. That this is the this is the whole concept of becoming an expert. You know, you you need to be able to sort out the wheat from the chaff. You need to be able to execute your your, your, your critical thinking skills, and and you need to be able to be up to date with what's going on in this world because it's changing very very quickly. You know, how do you how do you look at the how do you look at the the connection between gait retraining and, and athletic footwear? Is there a connection? You know, this is all the sort yeah. of stuff that we're going to be talking about. How do you how do you use a different shoe for a different injury? For example, could you use a minimalist shoe for Achilles tendinopathy? The answer is yeah. If you know what you're doing, you absolutely can, and it's a sensible thing to do. So that's the sort of stuff that I want to teach, basically. And do you talk about integrating uh, orthotics into certain types of footwear and what you should and shouldn't do? And do you go down that lines, or you don't touch on that? We do. We have a, a, a we have a big session where we analyze the current research. So we look at uh, we we actually pull up a whole series of papers, and it's like a it's like a uh, an open session basically where we will get down and get dirty and talk about it, and everybody has has an opinion, and then we kind of distill that and say and bring it back to the actual research and say, okay, um, well that was the discussion. Here's what the current research is telling us, and and inevitably we talk about the matchup of orthotic devices and footwear in that session. Okay, so you're doing Melbourne, Perth, Sydney, Adelaide. What happened to Brisbane? I don't know. <laughs> did, they do, I love Brisbane. did they do something to offend you? <laughs> no, they, 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 they didn't. I, to be quite honest, I have absolutely no idea. I think it's just at my advanced age, I have a, I, I can hear her now. I've got a seven-month-old baby upstairs, mate, so I think my brain is basically gone to mush. Um, but we will, uh, we will include Brisbane. Yeah. <laughs> okay. If enough people, if enough people come to me and say, "Hey, we want to do it in Brisbane," then we'll be up there. We'll be up there in a flash. Be no problem. Yeah. No. And you probably should do one in Bali. That'd be a nice one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well we could do one in Port Douglas, mate. I like. Oh, yeah. I do like one in Port Douglas. Douglas. I don't like Bali. <laughs> yeah. Do one in Port Douglas. That'd be cool. It's easy for me to get to. Um, but yeah. the other part, it's it's one of the things where you're saying, yeah, you know, a lot of people could be reading research and uh, yeah, reading articles and and making their own decisions on things and, and using their own knowledge and experience. But to fast track that, that's why going along to these things is so important. Because yeah. you, you, you're taking your 30 years of experience and you're, putting, you're cramming in all this into one day, which is really fast tracking the education for a lot of people. Yeah, it is. Look, I mean, I have this, I have this, this homie theory that, uh, you know, th- these days I think people do want focused education and CBD is just so, so incredibly important. But, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to go to a conference where it's a four-day conference and three out of four days is on wound care. Yeah, Because I'm whilst saying. wound care is incredibly important, it's it's not relevant to me at all. And so I'm paying a thousand bucks to go to a conference. I'm paying five hundred bucks for airfares and another thousand dollars for accommodation. So I've paid three grand to go to a conference that's only twenty-five percent relevant to me. Uh, and I think I think that's a lot of I think a lot of associations are so out of date and out of touch with what's required as far as continuing education goes, because they'll put on yeah. a conference for three days and there might be one talk on business, uh, one talk on, say, athletic footwear that goes for half an hour. And like you said, a whole pile of talks on all this other stuff. You're going, that's not really what I'm interested in, but I feel like yeah. I'm supposed to go along to this or I'm looked at poorly. Yeah, look, I, and I think it's, I mean, I love going to conferences. I love I love the networking side. Yeah, I love definitely. meeting my mates and going out, going out and having a few beers and, and you know, that, that side of it's awesome. But... You know, I think I like the American College of Sports Medicine model where they have, you know, they, they have, it's a, it's a massive conference. And, you know, they might, I think they have something like six or 700 papers, but they stream them so that it's over three days, but you're going to spend three days immersed in what you're, what you're interested in. So I think that's where conferences need to go. Or you, you have these other very focused educational events, um, you know, like we're running and other people are running where 
people could say, yeah, I'm interested in athletic footwear. I, yeah. I, I can see that to pay 400 bucks for that or $398 for that is going to be a really good value for money because I don't have to uh, spend all the other money. You know, and I'm going to be 100% immersed in this. So no, it's that, that's my theory anyway. Have you gone to Osgo over in the UK? the event they run over You know, there? I haven't I haven't yet, um, but I, I have talked to a lot of guys. There's a couple of good ones over there. Um, the Firefly one is apparently quite good too over in Sligo and Ireland, but I haven't uh, I haven't been there. I've been to a lot of conferences while I've been here. I just got back from the, the College of Art we went in Bournemouth, which was actually a pretty good conference. I enjoyed that. Um, good quality, really good speakers, um, quite a big conference. Yeah, so I know the Osgo in October. Um, <clears throat> I'm going over for it. I'm going to be speaking, which will be fantastic. Be fun. Be fun. It's finally nice to be invited to speak at a podiatry conference. <laughs> it's only yeah. taken me thirty years, um, <laughs> and, and I'm and I'm running actually a one day workshop the day before on, okay. uh, on a mark just a marketing marketing workshop for podiatrists, which is going to be a lot of fun. I'm really looking forward to that. So if people want to connect with you, Simon, I know that yep. they can go to bartoldclinical.com, and you've got a membership area. And there, where they can join in, what what do they get as part of the membership if they join? So, so Battle Clinical is is, is an, an online educational resource. So basically, you pay sixteen dollars twenty five for a month, which is um, fifty cents a day. That's a, that's <laughs> excessive. Yeah, have a think about that. And once you once you're on that, there is it's unlimited unlimited access to everything on the website. So literally hundreds and hundreds of evidence-based articles um, with with links, with videos, with all sorts of stuff. You can download this stuff, which makes it quite unique because nearly every other website, you're not allowed to download stuff. And this is 16 sixteen twenty five a month? Per month, $16.25 a month. Yeah, that's, that's it. That's what it costs you. That's it. Yeah. That's oh, geez, you're a crook. I know. <laughs> ripping, ripping, ripping people off, aren't I, mate? Um, but look, I want to make I want to make it accessible to four people. So you know, I, I think I think it's extraordinary value because basically what oh, I do, yeah, just a bit, is I take all the, I take all the hard work out of it for people. So you know, I mean, I'm on on online all day reading the papers, looking, at it, and then I'll 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 comment on that paper and say I'll distill it and say this is what it was about, this is what's good about it, this is what's bad about it, this is what you should take home. So basically, it's the lazy person's academic site. You don't have to do anything other than just read the conclusion if you want to, and you're good to go for the day. You must have a lot of me- you got you must have a lot of members. Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah, we 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 we're pretty pretty happy with it, and we get really good feedback. And stuff goes up um, nearly every day. So there's there's a, there's a new article goes up nearly every day. So you, you know you're getting access in a month. You're getting access to probably twenty different articles yeah. for sixteen bucks. The other, the other part of, of my website's called Barthold Gold, which is a bit different. Um, that's more expensive. That's a that's designed like a university course. Yeah. So it's a it's a module you buy. The first module is called musculoskeletal medicine, and that has within that module, uh, it has uh, four different courses: so Achilles tendon pain, um, plantar heel pain, anterior knee pain, and um, and and shin pain. And within those modules, there are 20 lessons, and these this is very sophisticated, so very high-end studio quality video showing going through all the examination investigation processes, and then the very current research on each one of those. And you buy that course just like you'd buy a university course. Yeah. And you can actually sit an exam, and if you pass the exam, you have to pass the credit level or better, then you you actually become uh, uh, you become a, a part of Bart or Gold Elite. And there are only two people in the world who've actually done that so far. So it's pretty cool. I will put I'll put links in uh, when I uh, or people listen to this. They go to my website. There'll be links to everything on your website, and I'll tag as much stuff in there as possible so people can find everything that you're actually doing. Well, that's that's great, mate. I, mean, I didn't actually think that this would come on being an advert for my website. Well, I don't want it to no, sound it's, that way, but like yeah. I said, the, the idea, like I, I was saying beforehand, the idea of this podcast is to. Yeah, educate people on the possibilities that there are in, in podiatry. It's not we don't just look at feet. There's so much more to what we actually do, and there's so much opportunity. And yeah. and I think when I have somebody that comes on the show who's my guest, I want them to promote what they're doing. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I want to promote what I'm doing. <laughs> if if exactly. I'm running something, exactly. I'm like, well, I may as well tell people what's happening. Yeah, and I think without sounding too cliched, you know, I think the whole thing is that, you know, if you're in a bit of a rut. 
um, I mean, this, this really enhances the way you practice. It really enhances your enjoyment. I mean, I've, I've never had a problem getting up and going to work on a Monday morning, never, ever. Um, because it, it you know, it seems to me that my life's full of new adventures, and that can be in clinical practice, or it can be in preparing a, a presentation, or whatever. But you know, as you as you become more immersed, more immersed in this, and as you become more exposed to things, well, then your professional career becomes so much more rewarding. You know, and, and yeah. poetry is an incredibly rewarding career. You know, and with with many many opportunities, as we've discussed. So, I think that's an important point that you said. A lot of people, I think, do go to work in the morning with that that gnawing pain in the gut of their stomach that they don't really want to be there and i think if you're feeling that then you need to make changes in how you approach your clinical day and and also think and this will sound funny coming from me and some people that know me will go oh that's crap tyson (laughs) (laughs) but stop focusing on the money and focus on the work that you do and the money will come if you focus yeah. on, and that's that's where my business has boomed. My my business boomed, and I had more fun when I stopped focusing on the money and just focused on being a better podiatrist. And when I did that, the money just flows with it. Yeah, I think you know, I think somebody told me that probably when I was two or three years out, told me made that exact comment, and uh, and I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, if you're so focused on making a buck, well, then you, you're not really gonna you're not gonna develop as as a healthcare practitioner to the level you should. Yeah. Um, and, and so you, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot because if you don't develop as a healthcare practitioner, then you're probably not going to be very good. And if you're not very good, you're not going to make much money because nobody will come and see you. So, you know, you, you, your, your primary focus is to be the best you possibly can in what whatever your chosen field is in podiatry. You want to be the best you can be. Um, and, and, and to do that, you've got to, you've got to upskill. That's the only way you can do it. Yeah, and that's when things really picked up for me. It was when I started attending... When I started spending, you know, like investing money in my education, I started traveling over to America and attending events there and talking to people. And I'd go over through a week just touring around to different people's podiatry clinics, bringing them up. Can I come in, have a look around, have a chat to you? And I just started learning off of other people, knowing that I didn't know it all. But there were a lot of people yeah. out there that were doing some great things and I wanted to know what they were doing. Yeah, it's it's that it's that exposure, you know, that that you're in a you're in a worldwide community. And, and it's that exposure. And I mean, how often do you go, you go back and smack by what people are doing? And, and how often does that give you ideas? I mean, the, I think the real, the real benefit, the real beauty of a conference is, you know, I'm quite choosy about where I go now. I go to conferences where I know um, there, there's going to be stuff from there that's going to get me either thinking or it's going to give me an idea yeah. for something that is going to, that's going to help me develop as a healthcare professional. Um, and that's that's what you want to be doing. I, I don't, actually don't understand people who don't go to continuing education events. I mean, I think they're stupid. But, <laughs> that's well, just I, that's I, that's I, the I short they're answer. Probably, they're probably out just sitting and thinking, I'm you know I'm making money. I'm you know yeah. dishing out orthotics or I'm selling shoes or whatever. Um, but 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 eventually that's going to come back and bite you in the bum because because you're just going to stagnate and you probably won't enjoy what you're doing. So yeah. it seems like a you know seems like a bit of a waste of time. Well, I hope you enjoyed listening to Simon Bartold today, and this is probably the fourth time I've actually listened to this particular conversation, and I pick up something new every time. As I mentioned, you probably would if you've listened to it yourself as well. But the one thing that really stands out to me is the amount of time and effort he put into his education and learning before he was paid a cent. But years down the track, that's what led to going to four Olympic Games and speaking in 42 countries. So I think that's something we need to keep top of mind. It's not everything we do, we must be paid for. Some of it is all about learning and just gaining experience. So I just want to mention my guest next week is Super Joe Pardo. Now, Super Joe was on this podcast back in episode 43 and he was talking about sales won't save your business. What we're talking about next week is Super Joe has his own TV show in the United States and we're going to talk about how that got started and what the TV show is all about. Give you a little hint, it is about small business and it's about saving small businesses. So that's it from me. Look after yourself, look after your family and I will talk to you again next week. Bye for now.